we think of things as being identified not only as, you know, their their color, their shape, what they can do, like carrying water, uh, their molecular structure, um, how much we like or don't like them. Then we think of these as definitions of things. But another piece of the definition of a thing is that another thing cannot occupy the same space as this thing unless it can go in it, right? It just doesn't occupy the same space. Bosons, you can put as many bosons that are exactly the same. You can put as many bo bosons as you want in the, in the space, as many as you want. You could also put them in any time. It doesn't matter. They're all considered the same boson. So a boson, a photon, let's say, from 1945 and a photon from like the sun up there today could be the same photon very easily. There's 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 countless number of exactly the same photons because all they need to do is have the same momentum, the same energy and the same polarization for bosons generally if for the same spin. So I think there's something there related to the hard problem of consciousness, the mind-body problem. I think bosons are more like mind. I think fermions are more like physical structure or brain or body. And the fact that they can interchange, if you cool, if you cool bosons enough, they can turn into fermions. If you take fermions and get them in the right configuration, like the, the, like the helium isotope, helium-4, they become bosons. That there's something there, this interface, this interface between the duality. The thing that links the duality is um, that is the real unification, right? In a world, in a dualistic world, the, the relationship between the dualities is the unification. So that's how I think about it. What is the role of the brain in this whole story? Because I understand that if we take uh, our body as a machine and if machine gets broken then we lose cognitive abilities it's just so obvious right what i don't understand is that when people get brain trauma and all of a sudden they be, they develop savant abilities then this whole story of broken machine doesn't add up so what is the role of the brain so we need the brain for for this to happen right for esps to start with to begin with i'm not sure we need a brain for esp um, I, I think you can show things like ESP in physical systems. In fact, Karen Modell at University of Colorado Boulder has shown uh, precog precognition or pre-sentiment-like behavior in a computer, which is randomly, he's randomly going to, or I forget if it was a computer or a voltage, some kind of voltage. Well, anyway, he was going to randomly unplug some device and then show that some, uh, I don't know, was it the voltage or was it the... Uh, I don't know, the random number generator attached to it. I don't know, you can read his work. But then he was unable to replicate it. Um, but people show this in different kinds of systems. I think it's the nature of reality, regardless of whether you're a person with a brain or a jellyfish or a rock. I think this, these are physical principles. And I think these physical principles have been taken uh, advantage of uh, let's use a more positive term, has been, have been leveraged by the human brain and by other brains to to interact with to interact with the non-physical. So consciousness is sort of by definition non-physical, right? Um, that's why the hard problem exists is that consciousness has subjective consciousness has qualia, the experience of something. So, Somehow, right, the bridge between the brain, the physical thing, and that's designed to interact with this non-physical thing has to work. Now, how does it work? Who knows? And I don't know that it has to work to do any of the ESP stuff. I think that's basic to physics. I think it has to work to do the long-term planning stuff, the experience of, you know, my father uh, and my anticipation of what he'll do or what he did. The memory stuff, I think it has to work to do that. That's not, we think of that as normal brain functioning and the ESP stuff is special. I think the ESP stuff is normal physical functioning and this this memory learning anticipation stuff is the special long-term use of a, of a localized complex 
physical system to interact with with consciousness. And so like, and yes, it's very striking. So I've had two friends now with strokes, one on a very mild stroke and one of extremely devastating stroke. Both of them survived. And one of the things that's clear in both of them is it is the brain and the and the mind are definitely related. Like you can't argue that they're not, right? But another thing that's clear in both of them is that over time, it's almost like the computer got fixed and now it can download the information it needed again from the cloud. It's it there's a feeling to which the information has been stored offline that was needed and it's coming back. And it, that that's not testable. Like you could also explain that that is that is testable, but not by me in these circumstances. You could explain that by the brain starting to make new circuits to do things, but you still have to explain how it's there's the missing explanation here about how it's directing itself to function in recovery. So like there's this observer that's not this like contained in the brain that sort of seems to be saying, okay, now we're going to have to get the system online. Uh, oh, now we can get those memories back. That, there's, it, it's like an orchestrating observer who is, I think, related to co- this global consciousness that we share in that is like repairing the machine. Like, like, uh, like, it's almost like as if the transmission fixes the radio. Like, if you could use a transmission to fix a radio, that's what it's like. And and there's some there's some cool applications of nano uh, technology where you can put these little nanobots in someone's um, brain and body <laughs> and have them respond to like frequency signals at the color spectrum or in the radio spectrum and have them do things. It's a bit like that, but it's always with the transmission fixing the radio. It doesn't feel like the radio is fixing itself. And so one there's ways to test that, but one way that I thought of that I think would be really cool would be to um, don't don't use people who have had strokes because that's too, too dramatic and it's too small a population. Just get a room full of people, like students in a class, and have them write down on a piece of paper if they still have paper and pens, if they're allowed, and have them write down um, the answers to questions that are on the on the projected on the wall. And they're simple questions about that they should know the answers to about pop culture. Like, who was the music artist who had the number one hit you know, last month or whatever, these things, or showing a picture of a a famous person, who is this? What I believe to be the case is that if you control your questions for amount of fame, right, these are all about like famous people, amount of fame, amount of recent exposure, which is a hard, the hard part of the problem. Well, Well, let's say you do that successfully. I think you'll have waves of forgetting and remembering in a particular location. I think that the people in the classroom will not be able to download certain information because it, to me, it, I've had so many times this experience with other people where if all of a sudden we could not remember this particular word or this particular actor or something. It's like the transmission is being blocked for all of us and then it opens up. And you can explain that in many, many ways that have nothing to do with some kind of a transmission of consciousness but one way is a transmission of consciousness for which the brain is like a filtering out. And so there's this filter model, I'm sure you've heard people talk about, of the brain acting like a reducing valve, right? This is sort of a famous model. And, and in Mount Sparisa, and I talk a little bit about this in, in, in um, Transcendent Mind, Rethinking the Science of Consciousness. And I think that's an interesting model. And, and it's supported by evidence from Morris Friedman, at Baycrest, when I mentioned this stuff about psychokinesis, so he and I are collaborating on on another experiment or another analysis related to precognition and the same phenomenon. But the phenomenon is that in certain stroke patients with frontal lobe lesions, they were able to, with their minds, use intention to make an arrow on a screen move to a particular direction. 
And the era was controlled by a random number generator. So what they were doing was influencing the arrow via the random number generator. And then he replicates, so he has two neuro- neurological papers on this, uh, sorry, ne- neurological patient papers on this. And then he replicated it using transcranial magnetic stimulation. So he would stimulate a part of the brain, which actually, re- when you when you use that stimulation, it actually reduces activity in that part of the brain. So he'd stimulate frontal lobes, reducing activity in the frontal lobe, and showed a, uh, uh, a unilateral effect so that left hemisphere, left, left frontal lobe was the one responsible for, and that matched the stroke patients, was the one responsible for this psychokinetic ability. So that again suggests this idea that some of our executive function is about screening out this stuff that is really basic. Like, I think rocks can do it, right? Like, I think, I think every physical substance can do those, and we're sort of screening it out. And we're because we're having to focus on the story that we have about how time works. And I'm in the here and now, and there was the past, which I can't change, and there's the future, which I could potentially change. And this whole story that we have going relies on us screening out information about the future, information about someplace in space way over there, information about people from people who have died, right? So it's like the question becomes, the really interesting question to me becomes, why is it useful for us to screen that stuff out? What what are we getting out of not having access to that stuff? Why is that what we're here on Earth doing? What is this? How is this beneficial to our growth as people? Because it's certainly happening. I don't know if it's happening through a reducing valve model, but we're definitely screening out something that's real and available. <laughs>